So the essential question is, I think, is less about what makes your product unique, that's still important, but the question we have to answer as marketers today, and honestly and brutally, is why on earth anybody should pay any attention to you? So yeah, so I'm gonna to talk to you, <coughs> excuse me, a little bit about the journey we've been on as a brand over the last um, two years. And I will tie it into this idea of the emotional free sample. I'm gonna to propose to you that that's what uh, marketing can work as. Uh, let me explain. Um, okay, so, this, uh, so it really starts with this moment. This is 1961. Uh, this is at the time an incredibly influential book by a gentleman called Rosser Reeves, who is uh, creative director of the Ted Bates Agency. And he proposes this idea, the unique selling proposition. And that the heart of that is, is this idea, that advertising is the art of getting a unique selling proposition into the heads of most people at the lowest possible cost. And I mention this <clears throat> because I think in many ways we're still sort of trapped in this paradigm. That's still how we think marketing works. We buy it, uh, we ram it home into people's heads, and the sole purpose of it is to, to land a proposition in people's heads. That's why today, for example, still on our creative briefs, we use the word proposition. Um, we still think in uh, this mode. Um, but obviously, there are many, many different ways in which marketing can work. And we've known this for, for quite a few years. So way back in 1991, a gentleman called Mike Hall conducted a big survey of advertisers, both on the agency side and the client side. And he said, how do you think, thinking about your last major campaign, how do you think your marketing worked. And he was able to cluster them into these four, these four major groups. Uh, salience, persuasion, affinity, and call to action. So salience is those people who said, well, it's just about getting awareness. We just want people to know and recognize our brand, typically for a new brand or a launch. There was a group that said persuasion, that says we have a, a better mouse trap here, washes whiter, we're gonna, uh, we're gonna give people the evidence of that and show them that our product is better. Affinity is the group that says, we just want people to like our marketing and therefore they'll like our brand. And call to action is the group that says all about action, we're gonna put a, a prompt to action in, that's how we're gonna measure it and that's how it's gonna work. So even back then, in uh, you know, nearly 30 years ago, there was a sense beginning to emerge that marketing works in, in very, very different uh, ways. Now, of course, I think there's obviously so much going on in the marketing world, so many conflicting different forces, but probably the biggest macro problem that we face as marketers is, is the war for attention. And Matthew Crawford, who's uh, spoken very eloquently on this subject, it's my favorite pithy quote on the subject. He says, attention is a resource, a person only has so much of it. And that's the essential problem we are all, we are all dealing with. Attention is this finite resource. Many of us grew up in a world where it was much, much more abundant and we were able to buy it much more easily. And that, of course, is uh, given rise to a whole shelf load of books. The attention economy is really what many industries deal in now. Attention is the new currency, as we all know, that we all, uh, we all deal in. And if you think, this is how I often pose it to our uh, teams. We talk a lot about content in the marketing world. Here are two things, both of, both of the uh, creators of these would describe them both as content. Uh, on the left, you have uh, advertising, but we now think of it as content. On the right, you have uh, content as a consumer would think of it. And you'll find, I just chose these at random, but you find your eye drifts towards the right, right? Because uh, it's, it's very hard to compete with this. And this was our problem. We'd grown up in a world where we were thinking about competing with Wendy's and Taco Bell and KFC, and that's hard enough, of course, 
And then we got used to the notion that actually we're competing with all other brands, we're competing with Nike and Google and Apple and all the great brands, but actually that's not, um, not the case. The problem for us is we're competing with all content ever made all the time. And this is what it looks like. I mean, we talk about this hypothetically and we look at the statistics, but it's salutary just to look for a moment about the reality. This is the war for attention as it's experienced in my living room and your living room and everybody's living room every evening as we're trying to uh, get through to people. That's our rich, engaging content on the TV and of course people are flicking back and forth between it if they're doing that at all. So it's been consumed at very, very low levels of attention. So the essential question is, I think, is less about what makes your product unique, that's still important, but the question we have to answer as marketers today, and honestly and brutally, is why on earth anybody should pay any attention to you, given that they have almost infinite choices on how to spend this very, very finite uh, resource of attention. And I'm going to argue that we're going to have to move from this, uh, this paradigm around thinking about a unique selling proposition, about you know, identifying the, the attribute in our product that's so different and so exciting. That's, we'll still have to do that, but we'll have to think much, much more about a content uh, proposition. In other words, what are you do why, am I, why am I willing to spend uh, this time with you? And I think at the heart of that is a communications model. I think you could do this in an individual piece. So obviously part of the answer to this is it should be much more creative. It should be much more engaging. And every marketer worries about that. We worry about that a lot, and we look at the scores, and we do lots of focus groups and so forth. But if we look at, in our journey, we studied the brands that we thought did this really excellently. And we found that at the heart of each of those brands is a communications model. Each of those had a point of view about what the brand's role was in the world at large, beyond the purpose of the company, beyond the, uh, the function of the product. They said, what does our communications do? And that begins to focus and inform everything the company does uh, within marketing. I'll, do, I'll give you some examples. So it's not just about how you, what you say, but it's also about why you say it. So let's take Nike for, ex for an example. We studied them closely. And Nike, at its heart, we think the marketing takes the role of a coach in people's lives, if you had to sum it up in one word. So if you take some examples of what they do, they do all these different types of marketing. They do utility marketing through their apps. But their apps are focused on that one single purpose. They're designed to make you a better runner. So they'll do things like send you an inspiring song when your pace is lagging as you do, as you do your uh, run. You're allowed to share with, uh, with other runners, uh, therefore you know, promoting your performance. They do community marketing also, but they do it in a very particular way. Nike Run is a group that get you out at five or six o'clock in the morning, and you feel, you feel part of something, you're much more likely to make that run. Their advertising, I think, is mainly about inspiration. They're big, uh, big, exciting ads full of testosterone and excitement that really make you want to uh, be part of it and, and put your shoes on. And then the, the retail experience is all about helping. So the what where salespeople are now coaches effectively. They're trying to find you the right equipment. They're trying to um, give you the right things to do. Apple is another example of a brand that we think has a very, very clear view of what their communications model is, and it's a product demonstrator. Apple takes the view that all of their products are unique, and the role of marketing is to demonstrate uh, that uniqueness. So radically different uh, uh, communications model, but still very valid for them. So that informs what the, the, the retail strategy with the genius bar, the tutorials in the store, and so forth. 
it, it, take a campaign like shot on an iPhone and it's uh, use of first time Apple ever used social media around Instagram, but it's essentially product demonstration. It's saying, here's what you can do with our amazing new camera and our amazing new phone. Uh, the emoji advertising you've seen in the Grammys, again, product demonstration. And the, 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 the online experience, as you'll all know, re really well thought through, rich and instructive, always pushing you to, uh, to a deeper experience in the product. Red Bull, another one, I think, very focused view of what, how the communications work. It's all about thrilling you, being a thrill maker. So they, you know, they throw astronauts out of a, out of a plane above Earth, Felix Baumgartner and film that. They're very into music, but it's a particular type of music, generally techno, very high octane, high adrenaline, very thrilling. They're into racing and race cars, and they're into, in a big way, action sports. So they've been highly selective, all informed around this uh, communications model. So what about us then? What about, what if that's, um, how these other brands work, what about us? This is the very first ad we did in 1957. Crispy, delicious French fries, only 10 cents. It's a classic, unique selling proposition from the period. Very product focused, very clear. And at the time, pretty differentiated. It was the first brand that offered that at a big scale. And, but then around the time of Hilltop, 1971, the same year, Hilltop, of course, being this famous pivotal ad for Coca-Cola, the same year, 1971, McDonald's, for the first time, it moves to a brand advertising campaign. This is a huge shift for the company because we move from telling people what the product is to how the brand makes you feel. And how the brand makes you feel is that it gives you a break and it makes you feel deserving of that break. And it's a beautiful campaign, it runs for many years, and it's still, as you'll see, the foundation of, what, of everything uh, we do today. We move from thinking about French fries to thinking about moments that we create around those French fries. This is just a uh, the one graph I'm gonna show you today it just, this is from Nielsen last year. It shows the amount of time we uh, in the US spend on media consumption every day. It's pretty, I find it pretty horrifying. It implies that nearly half of our day, over 24 hours, is spent on consuming media of some sort in different proportions, and it's going up. So that means the water in which we swim, the way we spend our day, is now in large part media. In other words, what you need a break from today is media. And this suggested a real role for our marketing. And so we've developed this, this model which we call feel-good marketing. And this is what we mean by an emotional free sample. Our idea is that every point of interaction around the brand however mundane, and I'll show you a few in a moment, can be a moment of delight. And in doing that, can kind of become the equivalent for the brand and the product itself. So it's not saying deep and meaningful things, generally. It's not asking people to think. It's asking them to feel something, and feel something that resonates with their experience of the brand. And I think that's true if you think about the line, I'm loving it. It's not a thinking line, it doesn't have a deep thought in it, it's a feeling line, it makes you feel something in your heart. And this very simple idea has profoundly changed the source of marketing we've done, or we're shift, experienced a big, a big shift from very functional uh, advertising to, to much more emotional advertising. Second point is we also have this sense of, uh, confidence or excitement in what we do. I think we'd lost somewhat in the past. Ray Kroc famously said, we're not in the hamburger business, we're in the sh in show business. Ray loved that sense of razzmatazz and excitement and fun and playfulness around the brand. And we're trying to uh, 
reinvigorate our brand in that sense. So I'm going to start off with the most, show you, showing you some examples with perhaps the most mundane of all. This is my favorite, actually. This was a restaurant manager in Spain. The, pro, the, the restaurant next door was stealing the Wi-Fi, and instead of suing them, which I think would have been our old instinct in the old McDonald's, we just used the Wi-Fi login code of this witty little message. If what you want is free Wi-Fi, stay where you are, but if you want a good meal, come to McDonald's. So at the most mundane point of interaction, we're able to do that. Here's another example. This is a, a youth um, attraction campaign from Australia. When I say the most mundane points of interaction, this replaces the old-fashioned paper job application. Millennials looking for a job in Australia? Then you may have to do a snack vacation. Well, forget a resume and a cover letter. McDonald's now testing out a new way to apply for jobs. Macca's is inviting people to apply for work by sending a 10-second message on Snapchat. Snap locations let people use a special lens that show the applicant in uniform. I better learn how to use Snapchat. Yeah. <laughs> McDonald's is Australia's biggest employer of young people. So to find the next generation of crew, we turned Snapchat into an innovative new recruitment channel and created ads that instantly triggered a snap location, transforming them into one of the McDonald's crew. All they had to do was tell us why they wanted to apply. Hi, my name's Alicia and I live in East New South Wales. I suited up for my Snapchat interview. I am really enthusiastic. Fast learning and all round good guy. And I really need a job and I love food, so hire me. We received thousands of snap locations on the first day alone. News spread around the world, becoming a global talking point. And in a matter of days, we placed young Aussies in real jobs. Meet McDonald's latest recruit, snapping up her first job through... I'll Snapchat. make up some time there. You get the idea. A mundane point becomes a, a point of interaction. These are posters our um, uh, French uh, office did. They're... they're backlit uh, bus shelters you see on a cold winter's night in Paris. They're kind of beautifully artful, I think beautiful objects in their own right. Instead of the normal price and promotion, they become objects of delight. Moving over to London, this is a, an IMAX theater in a big uh, traffic circle, famous traffic circle in central London, which we take over and make into a, uh, a Big Mac. Um, Here's a poster campaign we did um, for Big Mac's 50th anniversary. This is something we did in Canada, another very mundane point of interaction. These are directional road signs, which we, we play off on the golden arches, but they become not only functional, but fun and delightful. Um, a music festival in the UK, where we, we created an Airstream and gave out McFlurries, thus finding a real role for the brand, where it didn't really have one before in, in summertime. Um, this is uh, another a drive through from Brazil. In uh, Brazil, Sao Paulo, busiest traffic in the world. They have a no drive day. They take uh, all the cars off the road. We took the uh, opportunity to take the uh, drive through to our audience on that day. Um, as part of the Big Mac anniversary, we produced a special can also out of Brazil. Uh, in the US, we did, we tied in with Rick and Morty to re-release Szechuan sauce, which for those of you who watch the show is a kind of cult storyline. Uh, we created riots in the state of Florida as people lined up for that, we're proud to say. 
Um, and I'll show you one, um, two final examples. This is a campaign we did out of Canada that turns a small product detail into a uh, topic of national debate. To all beef, patty, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions on a sesame seed bun. The Big Mac is an icon, and for the first time in 50 years, McDonald's Canada was changing the recipe of it by adding bacon. But there's a lot of Big Mac lovers out there who might not agree with the change. So instead of trying to push this new sandwich on Big Mac purists, we did something else. Mmm. Now that's a Big Mac. It's not a Big Mac, it's got bacon on it. But they call it a Big Mac. They're wrong. You can't just- They're uh, wrong? We questioned it by asking, is a Big Mac with bacon still a Big Mac? We got people arguing over the world's most iconic burger. It can't be a Big Mac if there's bacon on it. No. 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 Just because you wear a hat doesn't mean you're not you. If we add bacon to this Big Mac, is it still a Big Mac? I say yes. The god of sandwiches, and now they've added bacon to it. The time is now, people. We added fuel to the fire with more questions that made people rethink their stance on the new Big Mac. Is a car on track still a car? Is a boomerang that doesn't come back still a boomerang? Are pants cuffed above the knee still pants? Our YouTube masthead broke an engagement record with 32 million interactions in one day, and 65% of people who voted thought it was indeed still a Big Mac. The campaign generated over 700 million impressions, and social mentions of McDonald's went up 188% in the first two days of the campaign. Even Americans wanted to know if it was still a Big Mac. I guess they're gonna let the North decide. But most importantly, we sold bacon Big Macs. A lot of bacon Big Macs. 37% more than initial projections. And thanks to the less progressive burger lovers, sales of the original were 14% higher as well, making Canada's craving for the world's most iconic burger stronger than ever. A Big Mac is iconic. It has an ingredients list. Two all beef patties, special sauce, lettuce, cheese, pickles, onions on a sesame seed bun. No bacon. Okay, so um, we, um, I want to conclude there. I think what, the perp what I'd like to leave as a passing thought is this sense. All of these notions are important. We've moved from talking about the proposition of a brand. There was a period when we talked about the emotional promise of a brand. We hear a lot about purpose today. We'll be talking about that later in detail. We take that very seriously too. But I'd ask you also to think about the presence of the brand. What is its role in the world? What is, it, what, what is the marketing actually doing? What is, the, what is your communications model? Thank you.